So as mentioned, I'm Rosalind McCann. I'm a Sustainable Communities Extension Specialist and coordinate the USU Permaculture Initiative. Our Logan Garden Coordinator is Hilary Stugart, and she's on our call today as well. I was glad to see that. Thanks for joining us, Hilary. And our Logan Permaculture AmeriCorps intern is Lacey Pierce, and she's also on our call and has coordinated today's webinar. And I'm going to pass it to Lacey to introduce our speaker right now. Thanks, Ross. Uh, I'm Lacey. I want to introduce Melanie Stock today. Uh, super grateful that you would do this for us. I'm really excited about this. So Melanie is the Urban and Small Farm Extension Specialist for Utah State, um, and her specialty is in soil sciences. So I'm really excited to see what she's got for us today. I'll also be sharing a Qualtrics survey. Um, so I'll be sharing that in the chat. Uh, I'll share it now in the beginning and then also towards the end. So if you would be so kind as to fill that out for us, that'll give us some feedback on how we can keep these things going for you and also potentially make them better. So with that, I'll turn it over to Melanie. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you for the introductions and thank you so much to the USU Extension Sustainability team for hosting this. Um, it made it super easy for me to just pop on. So thank you for that. Um, as a soil scientist, one of my favorite things to talk about is soil health and particularly through increasing our soil's organic matter. Um, and so we're going to get into what organic matter is and why that's important. Um, but right away, I want to say that it's really all about the garden seeds, which are compost and cover crops as ways to improve our soil health. So that's what um, we'll be focusing on today, really just three things, the basics of soil organic matter and kind of the state of that in Utah, and then a bit on composting 101 and cover crops. So I like to be kind of casual um, when I present, and so please, if you have any questions, let, let me know. Um, you can send a chat, or I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself, but please feel free to raise those questions because chances are that other people probably have the same question. So, and discussion's usually the most fun anyway, all this, me just yapping. Um, all right, so let's get right into it. Um, so I've got a picture of three soil profiles. A profile is something that, you know, if we were to dig a, a pit in the soil and take a look at all the different layers, that's what we call a soil profile. And so I just have a couple from across the U.S., starting in the Midwest and then heading west toward Utah, because I want to show the differences in topsoil um, for our native soil, so soil that's not been... Um, been affected by humans so much. So you can see in the Midwest, that soil is black. There's a tape measure here um, on the side that goes in feet. So there's that black layer or that top soil goes about three feet deep at least. It's even maybe flirting with a little bit past that. And so that really deep, dark black color that you see is organic matter. Um, and organic matter is stuff that has lived and died and become part of the soil. It's got a lot of nutrients in it and it's just fantastic for developing the structure of the soil and so many other things. I've got a list of all the wonderful things organic matter does in the next slide. So you can see the Midwest has a lot. It's deep. That's why it's called the breadbasket. Um, as, as we head west, so getting into eastern Colorado, um, you can see that the, the soil becomes a little bit lighter in color and it's also not as deep. And then as we make our way into Utah, um, the topsoil is shallower yet. Here we're at about a foot and a half, um, and there's less organic matter. So Midwest soil, there's around 5% organic matter on average. Here in Utah, our state averages between 0.25% in the south to up, up around 2% in the north. There's definitely, um, there's definitely soils that can have more organic matter naturally, like those in wetlands, um, places of poor drainage, things like that. But in general, our soils naturally have less organic matter. Um, and it really, it's not a bad thing necessarily, it's just something that we need to be aware of. And it, it really just happens because soils take thousands of years to develop and the conditions here in Utah are a lot different than other places in the US. So we have less rainfall, which means it's supported, um, our climate has supported fewer plants over time. And so those, there's been fewer plants to live and die and become part of the soil. And so as a result, we just have less organic matter. So organic matter is a really great thing to work on in our gardens and on our properties if we can. These are some of the benefits of soil organic matter. OM is my abbreviation for organic matter. 
Um, it just does a whole host of things. I listed a few here. It improves soil structure um, and holds nutrients and water for plants and animals. Uh, and then along with that, there's a range of different things that can happen. So it improves drainage and improves infiltration. So it's easier for water to get in the soil when there's more organic matter. It can reduce crusting, compaction, um, the list goes on. So it's, it's really wonderful to try to be aware of the organic matter in the soil and then we can increase it. There's some considerations with organic matter, particularly organic matter sources that we're gonna talk about um, but I'll get to those considerations later. So there's a lot of different uh, materials that we can actually add that will increase the organic matter in our soil. Um, one thing is just to simply grow plants on the soil and take care of those plants. Um, I'm thinking about my tomato garden. Uh, you know, you plant the plants, they grow, their roots grow, and then at the end of the season, unless you're pulling the plants up, maybe you just chop it at the surface, those roots are gonna die and that's gonna become part of the soil. Or maybe you have an ornamental garden. Um, just growing plants will increase organic matter. Um, at the end of the season, I think there's a common belief that a soil should be clean or we should remove all the residue so that it's nice and bare for the next year. And for me personally, um, I don't like to live by that rule. I like to keep my soils covered. I don't like to see naked soil. And I like to reuse things as much as possible. Um, so if my plants, if my garden plants aren't diseased at the end of the year, I absolutely treat them as kind of a residue or a mulch on my soil. So I'll cut them back, I'll let them lay on the soil surface, and that protects the soil over winter from rain and snow and wind impact. It can create a really great soil. Um, so just growing plants in the first place, there's different ways that we can add mulches to our soil. And by mulch, I just, again, just mean kind of a covering of the soil surface. Um, so that could be grass or leaves or straw, hay, leafy green residue. Um, a few options here. So here's some pictures of hay being added to the soil. Here's my rabbit, uh, Lil Bun, and she's on a bunch of leaves here. I don't let any of my fall leaves leave the property. Um, I, I harvest all of them mow them over with the lawnmower and use them on the garden. It's incredible how fast microorganisms will just break those down. Um, let's see, grass too is great. I collect grass clippings and also add that to the garden. Um, there's just a whole bunch of free things out there that you can do to add mulch to your soil, which will break down and add organic matter. Um, wood residues, you know, if you wanted to make kind of an aesthetically pleasing garden, a lot of people like to add shredded bark, things like that, and that's completely fine to do. Um, let's see here. So when you add wood to the soil surface, it will get broken down over time, but it takes a long time for that, a longer time for that to happen than say um, grasses and straws and things like that. But whatever you do here in Utah, I say do not add wood ash. I know it can be tempting to try to cycle as many um, materials on our properties as possible and have less waste leaving our properties, but wood ash is one thing that's not good to do here um, because it has a high pH, much too high for plant growth, and it has a high salt content. And we'll, we'll talk more about salts today. Um, people in the Midwest can sure use, that sounded like a Midwestern thing, <laughs> phrase to say. Uh, people in the Midwest might be able to do it. They get a lot of rain that helps leach that out. Same with the East Coast, uh, down in the Southeast. But here in Utah, we just don't get as much precipitation and so those salts really build up. So wood ash is not a good one to add. Um, and then compost, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on compost today talking about how you can make it and because it adds organic matter to your soil and it also adds nutrients, but some things to be aware of um, to not overdo it. So oftentimes we get questions about how much organic matter should we try to add? And again, native Utah soils tend to be on the low side for organic matter, um, generally under 2%, so there are exceptions. And it'd be fantastic if we could get up to 5%. Um, but when we do, you know, I'm, there's so many different types of gardens that we can grow. So in thinking of ones for food production, for example, maybe a vegetable garden, growing those kind of plants are so much more intense than what our native vegetation is. And so, even if you just wanna keep your organic matter where it's at, you actually will need to add some 
um, just to maintain those conditions because we're growing a more intense crop than our native vegetation. So we'll put some numbers on that. These are the general rule of thumbs for compost. Um, generally about an inch a year is safe and good to add on our annual gardens. And if you really felt like you needed to add more compost than that, um, maybe two to three inches, as long as you know that it's low salt. And we're gonna talk about that here coming up. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of compost can actually create salinity problems on our soils here in Utah. So it's something we have to be aware of. And so when I think about increasing my organic matter, it's really more of a marathon than a sprint. It's not gonna go from two to five in one season, but if you do um, these practices every year, it'll creep up at a sustainable level. Um, and then the last thing to note is that it could sound like a fantastic idea to add two or three inches, but in reality, that can actually, that's really a lot of material to be bringing in. So it takes 27 wheelbarrows just to get an inch across the thousand square feet. So that can be a limiting factor too. So you can certainly buy compost. There's a lot of different places to do it, but um, maybe think about producing it right at home. It's a great way to use um, otherwise waste products and kind of upcycle them into a nutrient and organic matter rich material that will really benefit your soil um, and therefore your plants and you. So the overall recipe for composting 101 is that you need about two parts brown material to one part green and the next slide is going to define exactly what that is um, but just know that there's two types of materials that we need two general types of materials that we kind of need to think about to have composting success. Um, so for example, a brown material would be something like dead grass or fall leaves, something that doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, and a lot of it but on the other hand has a, more carbon. Um, and green materials are things like grass clippings, uh, food waste, stuff like that. And so we need to think about the ratios of those two, um, layering those materials together, so my pro tip is I, we try to compost as much as we can at home. Um, and so sometimes, when, so we collect our food scraps when we're preparing meals in little yogurt containers and we take it out to the compost. Um, and so sometimes it can seem like that might smell a little bit. Um, so one thing we'll do is we'll save it up and then when we do a good weeding of the garden, we empty those food scraps onto the compost and then quickly cover it with uh, weeds and it, it doesn't smell that way. Um, composting is something that you do have, oh, there's a question about co coffee grounds. We'll get to that next slide. Um, you do have to water it in the summer, so keep that in mind. And then um, the thing I love about composting is it, you can really tailor it to your needs. So the more often you turn your compost, the faster it will process. Me, I'm a pretty lazy composter. I do it a couple times a year, but it's because I have low expectations for my compost. I just want it to be ready for the next spring when I spread it, but I know a number of people who like to use it throughout the growing season, so they're turning it all the time, which is a really great thing to do if you can. So um, more specifics about brown versus green materials. Again, you want a two to one ratio in general of brown to green. So here's just some examples of what brown and green materials are. And this, again, it's just getting at how much carbon is, is in it um, and how much nitrogen. So uh, when microbes are breaking down, these things, they need both. Um, they, need, they need the brown and green materials and in the right um, ratios to be able to do that at a, um, a good rate. So here's some examples of things. Um, I actually met a master gardener who composts cotton t-shirts. That would definitely be considered a brown material. I was really impressed with that. Um, here's some options for green material. Uh, coffee grounds are considered a green material. They actually have a lot of nitrogen. Um, I think it's about 2% nitrogen in coffee grounds. Fantastic source. Um, I've, I've met a number of people who actually um, have talked to coffee shops to save their grounds and then they can come pick them up once a week and add it to their compost. That's a fantastic thing to do um, as an option. So eggshells, we get this question a lot, well, where do eggshells fall in this? Are they brown, are they green? And they're really kind of nothing. Um, eggshells are, are made out of calcium carbonate, which is lime. And our soils actually have excessive amounts of lime. Back in that early picture of soil profiles, um, the Utah soil had kind of a whitish color um, in the subsoil, and that's because it could be for a number of reasons, but generally here in Utah, it's because of 
all of the lime that's in our soil already. So we don't need more lime in our soil, um, but a few eggshells certainly wouldn't help. For me, I, add, I give those back to the chickens. They can use the calcium more than the soil can. Um, is sawdust a good brown material? Yeah, sawdust can be a great uh, brown material, but be aware that it has a lot of carbon in it. So you're, you have to make sure that there's enough nitrogen going into your compost so that it breaks down. Um, this winter I was cleaning out my chicken coop a lot, which had a ton of wood shavings for, for bedding. And so it definitely, I had, um, I had to be aware of adding a little more nitrogen to adding more grass clippings and weeds, things like that, um, to be able to balance that out. So the great thing about composting is that it's not, if you added too many wood shavings or um, sawdust, for example, it's not like a game over situation. You'll just notice that it's not heating up when you turn it. It's not breaking down as quickly. And so you can kind of alter your ways by then starting to add more weeds, less, um, less wood shavings and, and so forth. So it's not, it, yeah, so it doesn't fail at any point. You just have to modify your action around that. What about dry weed clippings? Once weeds and grass dry out, um, they become considered a brown material. Great questions. Okay, these are things to not add to your compost. Um, you could, uh, okay, you could add wood, but you'd want to chop it up. Um, otherwise, it's going to take a very long time to compost it. Please illustrate the ratio. Okay, um, I will, I'll try to get to that in the next slide here. I think I'm running a little late on time here. Um, so things not to add. Meat actually is a green material. Uh, it's got a lot of nitrogen in it, but it tends to attract undesirables like rodents and raccoons and things like that. So we recommend not composting meat products, dairy products, cooked or salted food. The big problem here is that salt, so table salt, uh, sodium adds to your soil salinity. It is not a plant nutrient. Do not add that. Um, disease plants, it's a good idea to just get rid of those or you're gonna keep disease around uh, synthetics as well. You might even consider to not put certain weeds in your compost, particularly if you're a lazy composter like me. Um, since I'm lazy, I shouldn't say that, I'm busy. <laughs> um, because I turn my compost less frequently, it doesn't get as hot. And so I, this bindweed is one thing that even if you have just a little bit of the stem of it or any part of the plant, um, it'll re-sprout and it'll grow. And so with a cold compost situation, it's not getting hot enough to actually break that down. So I give that to the chickens too. Can't risk it in the compost. It would just have a great place to live. Um, some other things to think about are where to put your compost. Uh, mine really doesn't smell, but I also wouldn't put it right underneath my window next to the house. Uh, maybe a little ways away, maybe right, not right next to your, pop, your property boundary with your neighbors. Um, a sunny location. So, other ideas for location, it helps a lot if the compost is in the sun uh, during winter to keep that going. Even with my ways of not turning it frequently, um, my compost stays active up here in Logan, um, February through about November very easily. And it's because it's in the sun that gives it, a, that helps it a lot. But at the same time in the summer, that means I need to water it more often because it's baking in the sun. So that's up to you. But then having it close to a water source is important to, so that you make sure um, it's getting enough water. I, I like to have it close to the garden because then um, one of the gardens is on a sprinkler and so it actually just hits the compost and everything gets done together. But there's no one way to go, just some considerations. Um, here is the size. Oh, what about adding products such as biochar? You know, biochar, it's I don't know how I would answer that. I don't know that that's actually going to help your compost. That might be a good thing to add to your soil, um, but I don't think it would really benefit the compost. Size of the bins, um, they say the minimum size is a three by three by three. That's just for the most efficient composting. All of the action, the microbial actions really happening in the center of that. So that three by three by three gives a little buffer room. Some people like to have more than one bin. Um, one bin to just put the fresh material in, another bin that um, is kind of in the finishing stage where it's still breaking down, but you don't want to add more in because you want to be able to use it soon. And then some people like to have a third bin of just the finished compost. It's ready to go. It's ready to use whenever. Um, but you certainly could have fewer bins than that or more. 
there's also a lot of um let's see is there another what about okay there's also oops, i think i froze here okay there we go um, there's also a lot of design options for compost uh, microbes don't really care it's really up to us so it can be as simple as just taking some hardware cloth or chicken wire and wrapping it into a, a circle um, that's actually, I used to run a community garden. That's what we did. Our, our gardeners were required to compost all of their weeds. And so um, that was a nice inexpensive way to do that. Or you can make it a little bit more involved and kind of build a bin system. Um, we've got nine chickens and two rabbits and a lot of food waste, not a lot of food waste, but enough because we like to do use a lot of raw um, fruits and vegetables in our cooking. A two bin system worked really great for us, four by four by four. Um, here's some more options. You can see on the on the left, it can be inexpensive. It can be materials that you just find at home, um, or you can go store bought or store inspired. These were some neat ones of reusing um, those blue barrels, blue drums. Wouldn't that much aer aeration continually dry out the compost? A large issue at Moab, at least. So you want to have. That's a great question. Um, you want to have a lot of aeration. The, let's see here. My, these microbes really need to be in a high um, oxygen environment to break this down at an efficient level. That's one of the key things. And I've got, um, on this next slide here, I've got a really great video. There are questions about, can you help visualize um, two parts carbon to one part green, um, thinking about aeration. This video by Wasatch Community Gardens covers that really well since we don't have a lot of time here. Um, but one way to visualize that is maybe with five gallon buckets and that's what Wasatch Community Garden um, car Gardens get that or even like an ice cream container and picturing, okay, I've got two buckets of leaves to one bucket of weeds or food scraps or something like that. And then regarding the, the aeration, he gets into the importance of having that much aeration. You really don't want it to go anaerobic uh, which means not enough oxygen because that's when it starts to smell. But absolutely, that's a consideration, um, particularly in the south when things can dry out quickly. So here's a couple um, pointers for what, knowing when it's done. I'm going to take a look at that. Um, and then on compost, I just want to finish. I did a little study with our, um, our soil test lab. They also test manure and compost. And so I went through to just find what is the average uh, nutrient content, pH, salinity, C to N ratio, blah, 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 um, of these different types of compost that our lab has processed. I did the same thing for manure. There's these tables. You can find this fact sheet if you want to know more. Um, so I've got a bunch of manure-based compost, but down here, there's plant-based, and um, it's, it really produces a nice, um, a really nice product. So over here at the end, there is, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the last column is salinity. And you'll see that the number there is three on average for a plant-based compost. That is about as good as it gets. That's really, really good. Um, a lot of our plants like vegetables, fruits, uh, flowers, they are sensitive around two. And so by not using manure, we can keep that salinity down in the compost, um, keeping it down around three. Anyway, there's a few things to take a look at. Municipal gets at our landfills, some of the products that they offer. You can see that tends to get up there a little bit. So making a plant-based compost at home is a fantastic way to go for reusing waste products um, and cycling those nutrients back into the garden. Here is my salinity note. Um, I kind of showed up here that these salinities range. It's nice and low at three with a plant-based. Um, salt is a huge problem here in Utah, and it's really because we just tend to have, we naturally have a good buildup of salt because we just haven't had the rain to wash it through over thousands of years like other states in the U.S. have. Um, and so salts can just reduce plant growth and yield. Just, just so you know, it can even kill plants if it's too high. Our magic number is two. You want your soil salinity around two for the best growth, but most fruits and vegetables can go up to around four and be just fine. But um, I would say the most common email I get is asking what's wrong with the garden. Um, they'll send me some pictures. It looks like salt burn. So my first question is, how much comp have you used compost and how much have you put down? Um, and the answer is always a couple inches. And then we, we take a look at what the compost was, blah, blah, blah. 
So just be really careful that more is not always better with compost. About an inch is a safe amount of, to go. Plant-based plant is also a good thing to do. So compost is not the only way to increase your organic matter. We talked about different mulches, growing plants in the first place. And so I want to introduce this last topic of cover crops to increase organic matter. Does anybody know what a cover crop is? I've been talking fast and continuously. So I'm curious, add it to the chat or even if you want to unmute yourself, I'm curious if who's all heard of these and what, you're, what, what you think they are. Oh, uh, yes, exactly. So one person responded, a crop that improves soil just by growing in it. And that is a beautiful description. Um, so a cover crop is something that you grow more for your soil than for yourself. Um, it can help supplement nutrient needs and improve soil health. Um, these are all the benefits of, hmm. these are all the benefits of cover crops. Um, it can actually be a nitrogen source. This is the number one plant nutrient. Oftentimes it's the only nutrient that our gardens really need um, or are, can become deficient in. But these are all the things that they do. Um, they build organic matter. Again, they're a plant that we grow just to help the soil. Um, and so whether that's just the roots that are adding organic matter or we terminate that cover crop by cutting it and letting it um, mulch on the soil surface, there's just, it adds organic matter. And by doing that, it helps stabilize soil particles, it helps scavenge extra nutrients, and it also can help suppress weeds. So there's a couple of fact sheets here on cover crops if you're interested. But um, what I want to say is that there's a lot of different cover crops, and we'll talk about a couple in the next slide, but it can be a little bit daunting to figure out which one to even buy seed for and grow. And so my recommendation is to pick one or two goals to help you decide what would be best. And so these are the questions I like to ask myself when I'm selecting a cover crop. Um, what benefits do you want from that cover crop? Do you want to have a nitrogen source? Do you want it to just scavenge some nutrients? Do you want it to just produce a lot of biomass in a short amount of time? Do you want to make sure it's low maintenance, easy to grow, easy to kill? Um, also, when could you actually add it to your garden? Uh, for me, I, I like to try to grow as much food as possible at home and so I'm not willing to put to have an entire garden go to cover crops for an entire year but I like to sneak them in on the ends of the seasons so I'm picturing my vegetable garden um, I tomatoes are growing they're looking great maybe I'll under seed I'll throw some seed in for a cover crop in August let that start to take off and then as the frost kills the tomato that cover crop can continue to grow in the fall and if it's not one that dies in winter, it'll continue in the spring before I plant my vegetables again. So it can be a really nice placeholder um, on the ends of the seasons. Or maybe I just want one that dies in winter so I don't have to deal with it in the spring. That's also an option. So there's a lot of different things you can ask yourself um, because one cover crop can't do everything, but um, this helps you kind of prioritize what, you're look what you might be looking for. So here's some options for cover crops. Um, there's a whole group called legumes. And these are the ones that will actually add nitrogen to your soil. Our student organic farm up here on campus actually uses a combination of a little bit of compost every year and hairy vetch um, cover crop to supply the majority of their, their nutrient needs. Um, there's also grains and grasses like rye and wheat that can be great. Um, there's also broadleaf plants that can count as cover crops. Um, I've got a few friends who really like using buckwheat. Um, so there's just a lot of options. Since I have rabbits, I like to do, a, sometimes I do a um, pea and oat mix because I can actually harvest some of that for forage. So there's a lot of ways to take it for whatever your, your situation is and what might work best for you. I just wanted to highlight the legumes because they are a nitrogen source. Oftentimes that's the only thing that our plants really need um, here in Utah since we accumulate other nutrients so well. And so I wanna give a spotlight to hairy vetch because um, this is one of our biggest producers of nitrogen. It can produce one to three pounds per 1,000 square foot, uh, square feet, which is actually the rate that most of our vegetables need. So it could supply all of the nitrogen needs if done correctly. Um, so just a little bit about growing it. 
The key thing though is just terminating it at the right time because um, it can become a weed if you don't. So you wanna kill it at about 50% bloom for the maximum amount of nitrogen. You certainly don't wanna let it go to seed. Um, and so ways to kill it would be, um, you can cut it really close to the soil surface and that should do it. Um, I think that's probably the best way for permaculture. And in fact, if you were to cut it at the soil surface, let that above ground matter just kind of fall to the surface, then it acts as a nice mulch. Um, so that'll kind of help suppress weeds and it'll slowly break down. There's a number of large organic farms that one of the challenges um, in organic farms is the weeds because they, they can't spray them with herbicides. And so what they're kind of going to, in some cases, is actually planting a cover crop that produces a lot of biomass and it doesn't die in winter. So then in spring, they actually cut it. Um, it sits at the soil surface that covers the soil um, to help reduce weed growth. And then they plant right into that. Uh, so a nice way to, to make some mulch too. So a little bit on hairy vetch. Um, but when it says one to three pounds of nitrogen, that is if you can keep it growing into May. So for every week um, or 10 days that you let it continue to grow in May, it uh, pretty much adds another pound of nitrogen. So this might be a nice one for a warm season garden, something that you'll be, played, you'll be planting later anyway. It wouldn't be great um, in most situations if you were gonna plant an early crop like onions, for example, that need to go in much earlier than May. So let's see here. Are there, um, that's all I have on cover crops. So my summary for today is just that organic matter is a great way to improve the health of your soil. Our native soils tend to have less organic matter. And so there's a lot of ways that we can try to increase that. Two ways are with composting and cover crops, which we went into a little bit more depth, but I know that there's so much more to talk about. Um, and so with that, I'm open to questions. I think that there were a bunch that came through when I got all excited about cover crops. I didn't keep an eye on the chat. Um, a cover crop that improves the soil just by growing in it. I would say that would be all of these cover crops. Um, they just have their different benefits. I don't think, oh, I've got radish here. This one's a fun one. Uh, you can plant radish in the fall. And then if you picture how big that radish is and you just let it die, sometimes it can smell a little bit. But just picture the size of that pore that it's creating. Um, other things like clovers, um, the oats were really easy to grow and they, they winter killed very fast. Just picture all this biomass that you're making, all this plant material that you wouldn't otherwise be growing that just gets returned to the soil. And so for that matter, all of these are great options. Let's see here. Yes, planting an intermediate crop in between using the garden for real use. Yeah, Glenn, that's, that's my situation. I just don't have the space to let an entire bed go to a cover crop. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, but it works, in, it works really well in between seasons. Um, one thing I, I did run into, I tried a bunch of cover crops in the fall just to kind of see what I liked, how easy it was to grow. My mistake was planting rye in the area where I wanted to put onions in in the spring because then I had to terminate that rye, which is a hard one to terminate and get onions in at that same time. And so that was a lot in a short amount of time. Let's see. There's a recommendation to watch The Biggest Little Farm. I'll have to check that out. Are there any free resources? Is that, I'm not sure if that means in terms of free cover crop seed or uh, information about cover crops. I guess information wise, there's a lot of free information online, also through USU. I don't know of any free seed sources though for cover crops, but I do know that most seed companies that you would buy your regular garden seeds also sell cover crop seed. Which cover would you recommend for compacted soil? And also I've heard that daikon radish are really good. Yeah, daikon radish are, sometimes they'll be considered a winter radish and they have such, they're so, they're so big and they're long. Those are fantastic. I think there's a picture of me with some daikons mixed in with other winter radish. That's a good one. So for compacted soil, um, alfalfa actually has a nice taproot. Now this one takes a little bit longer to grow and get established. Um, but if you can, it's got a nice taproot that goes into soil, so that can help kind of loosen things up and push the soil apart. But even these other ones that don't have a taproot and they have more of a fibrous root system, even those root fibers getting into the soil, living and then dying, and which creates organic matter in those spaces will help. So I don't think you can go wrong that way. What about bark? Um, bark is a, yeah, bark is a nice organic matter source that can go at the soil surface. 
it takes it a little bit longer to break down, but it absolutely um, can add organic matter to your soil. You want to be careful that it doesn't take nitrogen from your plants. Um, nitrogen is needed for plant growth and that can get tied up. But honestly, I haven't ever seen a problem or I haven't had a problem with it, especially when you think about bark that's just added to the soil surface. Yes, it might tie up some nitrogen right at the soil surface, but your plant roots are down a ways anyway, so that it shouldn't have to be too much of an issue. If you do add it to your compost though, you're gonna have to add extra green materials to help that break down. Soybeans. Um, soybeans could, yeah, you know, we list these, I've got these selections of cover crops listed as the typical ones we think about, but honestly, if we wanna think outside the box, so many plants could really count as a cover crop. Um, so, sure, for soybeans, I don't, yeah, I don't think that would be a problem, especially if you're, it kind of depends on what you're doing with them, though. If you're letting them die and become part of the soil, then they would have more cover crop features for, versus if you're harvesting them. Melanie, I think that the participant was wondering if there's any free resources for compost, bark, or soybeans, et cetera, that um, they could access. So down here in Moab, for example, there's a, uh, I know a handful of farmers will offer manure for free to community members and then at times the Moab City offers free mulch, uh, wood mulch for people and so uh, I think that was the intention of the question. Oh thanks for clarifying that Roz and the the person who added that to the chat. Um, thank you yeah thank you for answering that because uh, let's see otherwise I don't really know of any sources. Um, depending on where you are, sometimes tree care services will offer free wood chips. Um, be aware that a lot of times when people are getting their trees cut, it's for a specific reason that they're diseased, so you might be a little weary of that, maybe not. Um, what I would be most cautious about though are those free manure sources because when something's free, it's, I don't know, it's human nature to just want to get a bunch of it, and manure in particular has a high salt content, and that is, that is a real way to increase your salinity. Also, manure has a lot of phosphorus and potassium. So the three main plant nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But plants need the most nitrogen, more than anything else. And so manure tends to have about equal parts, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And so what tends to happen when adding manure to soil is that you can easily add excessive amounts of phosphorus and potassium and still not really have enough nitrogen. Um, too much phosphorus isn't gonna really hurt your plants but it is an environmental contaminant. Um, that is what causes algal blues in uh, Utah Lake, for example. And potassium is actually considered a salt in the soil. And so too much potassium is gonna increase your salinity level. So be careful on manure, mainly because of the salt, but also because of those, um, the phosphorus too. That's a really good point about manure. And um, one thing that might be a possibility, so again, down in Moab, we have a social media group called Moab Classified Ads, and there's a lot of community dis discussion that happens on that. So if there's a similar forum in Logan, you could always post on there in search of leaf, um, bagged leaves uh, that you could pick up, and I'm sure several people would offer those for you for free, and that's such great compost. And instead of that going to the landfill, which you know, Logan, it is turned into compost still, but you avoid some of that uh, in between process and can compost that yourself, I'm sure, with donations. I know Ivy had some questions about things she could plant and uh, about chicken manure, which I'm sure we'll get to in a second. For those of you who need to leave, completely fine. We'll just continue to field some questions until we've exhausted those. If you have the time, Melanie, for a few more minutes, great. Thanks. Um, one thing that I want to announce while I'm talking and then I'll stop talking is that Lacey shared with everyone, we can't do a live link to the survey in our chat, but if you copy and paste the link that Lacey shared, it's just a very brief evaluation which helps us justify continuing these into the future. So if you enjoyed today's topic, want to hear more, please just take a few minutes to complete that. And thanks for coming to today's talk. Thank you all. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for adding that about leaves, Roz. Um, I... I can't stress enough that it, and it's such a it's such a great um, source that can be right at home. Um, it, it can include some seeds, um, but a lot of times people have them bagged and right at the end of their driveway too. I I can't tell you how many times we've gone on walks and I'll be like, oh, I really want to get that, but I've never had the guts to actually knock on someone's door and ask if they wouldn't mind my taking them. But um, there's so many around. It, that's a nice way to go. 
Also, um, oftentimes after fall events, the straw bales are free or at a significantly reduced price. And so you can find those on the classifieds from time to time. Um, but I haven't found a good wood chip source that's free or, and I really haven't found compost either. There was a question about chicken manure, very high in salt. And I actually have, I think I put a picture of it. Yeah, okay, picture of chicken manure here in that little circle. So when you take a look at chicken manure, there's all that white on the poop, and that is actually their urine. So when they excrete their manure, the urine is right with it, and the urine is where all of that salt is. So the salinity for chicken manure, chicken manure compost is actually 16. Remember, our magic number was two. So that's really high. Um, and when we compost chicken manure, what we're actually doing, we lose, and I should say this is for all manures, when you, in the composting process, you lose some of the nitrogen to the air. It's just something that can't be helped, unfortunately. But the phosphorus, the potassium, and the salt, that all gets concentrated down. And so, um, so it's really high because of the urine, which is hard to separate off. Um, is there any way to rinse the salt out? So that's called leaching, if you were to try to, to rinse it out. Um, that's a great question. It's something I'm really interested in. And, it's actually a lab test that we've been meaning to do up here on campus is, is finding out, okay, we've got these different compost sources. How much leaching, how much water do we need to run through to have a lower salt product? I don't have an answer for you. That's a, something that we really need to study, but know in that process that you'd also be leaching out nutrients too. Both would go hand in hand, but it would be possible definitely to reduce the salt. Um, any thoughts on adding manure tea to mulch or biochar for soil amendment? So manure tea could be a good, a good thing to add, but you're also going to be extracting salt in that process, and then you're not getting the organic matter, um, right? You're leaving that organic matter behind. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm opposed to it, but I feel like there's more benefit in also having the organic matter with it. Um, that's just my opinion, though. On that. So my fact sheet that I have here, that also has, this is all just the table for compost, but there's one on manure too. So you can take a look at the different manure sources. Um, funny enough, deer manure is like the best one. It's got the lowest salt content. Rabbit manure is pretty good too. Um, but anyway, there are some lower salt options for, for composting manure and adding it to the garden, but it's still going to add a little bit of salt. Um, how much coffee ground to leave. Can you, uh, I'm sorry, can you clarify that in a quick follow? How much coffee ground to leave? Oh, how, like probably the ratio. So the ratio of coffee grounds to leaves, and I can't stress enough that link that I have, um, which we can make that these available hopefully. This one right here from Wasatch Community Gardens, um, he talks all about how to actually calculate that out. Uh, in a really neat way. Um, but so how much coffee grounds to leaves? That kind of gets back at this two to one ratio that coffee grounds are considered a green material. So you would want two times more leaves by weight to that of coffee grounds. Hopefully that answered it right. I interpreted that right. Okay, are there any questions? Oh, someone added bar uh, bark wood chips increase mycelium growth too. Yeah definitely get a lot of beneficials by adding these. You know, we talked about adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil by adding these different um, materials, but then, and we really didn't talk about all of the living aspects of the soil, all the microorganisms that benefit too. So thank you for adding that. Let's see. Why does it say 20 to one? Um, yeah, I didn't touch on that much during, or at all in this, in this presentation. Um, so I should do that now. So when we're categorizing brown versus green materials, um, this is really getting at that carbon to nitrogen ratio, the C to N ratio. So what this means for coffee grounds means that there's 20 carbons for every one nitrogen. And I think the number is if it's less than 30 or 35, it's considered a green material. And if it's greater than 35 or so, it's considered a brown material. So I wanted to just put the C to N ratios in here to give you an idea of how much carbon is really in it. So for example, and these are just the averages, these range quite a bit. Fall leaves have about a 60 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. So technically they classify as a brown material, but woody materials like 
sawdust and, and things like that, their C to N ratio is 200 or more to one. So that is even more brown of a brown material. So you, you might wanna consider that, that we wouldn't necessarily treat them all equally, right? If I'm gonna add a bunch of woody material, I might wanna increase my green materials more. And I don't mean to make this complicated at all. You'll just naturally notice when you're turning your compost that it's breaking down more slowly. Well, maybe that's because there's more woody material that's got a higher C to N ratio. So then in turn, add some, some leaves. So it's not that you have to do a bunch of math immediately and consistently. It's just kind of keeping these general rules of thumb, a two to one ratio. Um, so, so coffee grounds are a great green material because they have a low, um, a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. There's only 20 carbons for every one nitrogen as opposed to over here, um, woody materials have 200 carbons for every one nitrogen. And, and bacteria really need to have both of those things. I guess I, I like to think of carbon as kind of like sugar for microorganisms. They really want to break it down but they've got to have their nitrogen too. It's like water, they need to be able to wash that down. Um, so they need to have both things. I was, I was, someone else was confused by those numbers versus C to N too. So thank you all, thanks for um, asking that because that was a common question. And then they also post, thanks Tim for putting that video link here so people can directly click on it. James is awesome, he's fantastic. He runs the Green Team Farm and um, and they have an excellent composting uh, system there. So, and he, he talks about the five gallon bucket rule for being able to calculate this more precisely if you want to. For me, but honestly, it will, it will break down, especially if you can kind of layer it and be, a, and be aware of that at the time. So in thinking about you're adding weeds to the compost, maybe then you add some wood shavings or some fall leaves, maybe you add your food scraps and then you, I like to quickly cover those um, just to make sure there's no smell um, with weeds and things like that. And it really does, it, it wants to compost. It's just us doing things to make it more efficient on top of that. So James is a soil guru. guru. That's a good place to end it, I think. If there's any other questions, you can take them. Otherwise, I think we've got it all. Yeah, we'll field this last question from Ivy and then for everyone's time, Melanie, we'll and the discussion there. What a great series of questions and thank you for answering all of those. Yeah, you all make this discussion so much fun. Knowing how salty chicken manure is, what do you do with the soiled saving, shaving slash, slash straw when you clean out the coop? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I mentioned earlier that I like to try to think of ways to use everything on the property and have you know, and that's just me. I like urban homesteading and kind of nerd out on it. And I try to think about how can I have as few things leaving the property as possible. Um, and so with the chicken manure, I compost mine. I throw it in the compost. But then when I use compost in spring, I limit mine to about a quarter inch. Um, so when I moved into my house, it's about 100 years old. The people who lived in it the 10 years before me uh, left a blank canvas of a yard, if you will. So I got a soil test right away and I found out that my soil salinity was already at 1.75 without people having gardened it really before or in a long time. Um, and so knowing that I was at 1.75, my magic number being two, I know that I need to be really careful about my salinity. It's just, and so with chicken manure, I wanna reuse it. Um, I, do, I, I put it right in the compost and then I just limit that compost amount that I spread. Um, let's see. You, you would never want to add it directly to your garden because you will get, um, you'll get some burn. And even if it did, didn't burn the crop too much, there'd be so much nitrogen released that the plant would actually go into, and I'm thinking about vegetables in this case, the plant would kind of go into this luxury place where it doesn't need to produce its fruits or its seeds. It just makes all this beautiful vegetation. Um, but chicken manure is one in particular that you want to compost first. I, I think that's true for all manure for garden use. Um, and wanting to compost it first, but that's uh, moderation is key.